Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. And welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Pastor Ken Warlon, who just brought our Easter message, A Transformational Journey, a look at a passage from Luke 24. Welcome, Pastor Ken. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so this message about the transformational journey, we looked at when Jesus uh, appeared after the resurrection, and he walks along with the two travelers, and they begin to have their eyes opened and their hearts revealed and begin to see Jesus. And so we had quite a few questions come in around this. So I'm just going to start with them and we'll head into it. So one question that we got was, where do we get the word Easter? Okay, that is a good question, but probably not going to come out of uh, biblical text. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the word Christmas. It's one of these words that has been incorporated into the faith along the way to describe an event that did happen in history that we're celebrating. But you can Google the word Easter and probably get uh, a dozen different etymologies. And so I would encourage the questioner to do a little reading about it, and it's kind of interesting, but move past the word to the event. And that's the resurrection. Okay, interesting, didn't Mm -hmm. know that. Uh, The other question that came in is, why do some Christians celebrate the Passover? Is it the Seder or the Seder? Seder. Seder, the Passover Seder, Mm -hmm. and some do not. Well, um, let me say this first. It's a meaningful thing for any Christian Mm -hmm. who chooses to do it. Um, It's kind of like taking a tour to the Holy Land, um, which, once you go, you're like, wow, that has just enriched my faith all the more because now I know what it looks like. And when you read about Jesus went there, I know what that looks like. I've stood right there. And, um, and so I think uh, the meaningfulness comes for that Last Supper mm-hmm. that we celebrate on Monday, Thursday, to go back and to sort of put our mind into the place of, okay, this is the, the, the celebration that he was having with the disciples um, to go through that, uh, 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 especially with a Messianic Jew mm-hmm. or a Christian or a fulfilled Jew or completed Jew um, who has been steeped in the traditionalism of Judaism, but also can incorporate the... Um, the, it's almost clear as a bell. Wow, how could you not see mm-hmm. this symbolize this That's, and this symbolize yeah. this? And as he goes through the meal, um, so I recommend it. Yeah, um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, so speaking of Old Testament, yeah. and uh, the question came around that says, uh, what scriptures were they studying at the time? The two trap. Travelers and Jesus. Yeah. Well, like I said, we, we, he doesn't give us the verses. Mm-hmm. I guided us to a few uh, in Isaiah and Psalms, Deuteronomy um, 18, which might have been the scriptures that he was using. What we know is that the scriptures were at that point just the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. That's all that there was. Because um, the New Testament, this was happening. It hadn't been written yet. So it was... Uh, it says, you know, he took them to the prophets and, and the law and kind of guided them through. So uh, we have to imagine that he was pulling out some of those texts, like I tried to do, that would have very easily uh, served as signposts for them mm-hmm. to say, oh, so that's what, okay, we were, we did see this come to fulfillment. And, and so... Wouldn't you love to be part of that? Yeah, of course. That would be a good Bible study. <laughs> I'm part of that study. Yeah. Okay, so uh, talking about Cleopas, yeah. this question came in that said, wouldn't Cleopas have been Jesus' uncle? Based on John 19.25 that says, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, makes the encounter even more miraculous since it was his family that didn't recognize him and invited him into their home. Sure. Yeah, and that very well could 
would have been, in fact, um, the late uh, pastor from the 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, James Montgomery Boyce, is the one who uh, wrote a piece years ago that I found compelling, that's why I mentioned it, that some think it was Cleopas's wife that was traveling along, and that's the reference. Some uh, say, but wait, 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 that's a different spelling. Well, yes, but scholars point out spellings that are different by a little squiggle or a little letter in English, that is an incidental or a secondary uh, of secondary importance, not a, a critical factor. So it very well could have been family, which does make it all the more, it's like, wow. So the resurrection body, you couldn't uh, recognize. If it wasn't, uh, and that's a different Cleopas than this Cleopas, then, um, well, wow, nonetheless. Yeah. Um, that there he was. Okay. Um, so you, you kind of teased this and mentioned a little bit in the sermon, uh, but the question came in that says, okay, we'll take the bait, we'll bite. Why couldn't they recognize Jesus' resurrected body until he broke the bread? The bread, yeah. Well, this is an interesting thing. You see in these appearances uh, in the resurrection, I think there's 11 of them in the New Testament, if you add them all up in the Gospels. Um, it was... A, a, it was predictable that people couldn't recognize him. Um, Mary goes to the tomb and uh, sh 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 she's like, why have you taken him away? And, and then he says, you know, Mary. And she's like, oh my gosh, whoa. You know, and, and so there is apparently some perfectedness that comes to the resurrection body um, that doesn't deprive it of the very real qualities that we are familiar with mm -hmm. in a body, such as taking food. He was taking food, he was eating bread and, he, and the fish with Peter on the beach and this sort of thing. So there's a taking food and there's even a tangible, I mean, they were doubting Thomas said, I believe when I can touch, I wanna feel, you know? And so it's a, it's a real deal and yet he can pass through walls. Um, and the passage that we were in in Luke continues as they run back to Jerusalem and they get to the 11 and the others and they're there and they're saying he's alive and then whoop, Jesus appears there and comes through the locked doors and they're like, whoa, you know, and, and, um, and he's telling them, no, I'm really here. And, and so there is this quality to the resurrected body that makes it similar but different. different. And that's as much as the Lord saw fit to let us see, I guess to, to give us sufficient assurance and hope for what lies before us, um, but to leave us with sufficient anticipation until we get there and experience it ourselves. When we get our own resurrection body, we are in Christ. Yeah, we can maybe go through doors. And <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Um, okay, so uh, back to uh, just some basic questions around the resurrection, mm -hmm. uh, since we, we focused on that sure. today. How do we know that God actually rose? Yeah, well, you, you have uh, um, philosophers refer to a a mistake that is makeable and a mistake that is not a makeable mistake. If he had only appeared to two people, four people, one here, one there, and that's it, that might fall in the category of, uh, okay, maybe those people were just wishful thinking and that was a makeable mistake. But then you get to 1 Corinthians where it says, and then he appeared to 500. Okay, now that is a not a makeable mistake. That's an unmakeable mistake. Um, and so uh, what philosophers call reductio ad absurdum, that, that leads to an absurdity to, to say that these people just were all uh, having these thoughts going along mm -hmm. in their mind. And so um, I think our evidence comes through these witnesses that attested to it, and more importantly, then would go and die 
for it. Mm -hmm. Because remember, the big question um, that's raised in that film I mentioned, The Case for Christ, um, isn't why did they scamper off terrified? That makes total sense. But why did they come back and even say he's alive when it meant we're going to kill you for your faith? What thinking person chooses to die for what they know is not true. We just made it up. Pain has a way of flushing out the truth. And yet none of them came off the story. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, no, 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 it's okay. You can kill us because for me to die uh, is gain. To live as Christ and to die is gain and it's going to be just fine. And they would even bless the people who were going to kill them and, and forgive them and feed them food before they killed them. And, you know, it's like, okay, you must have seen something that really was transformational. Mm -hmm. So... Jesus went to the cross and died for our sins. Mm -hmm. And so when you say God died for our sins, what does this logically mean? That we no longer go to hell or that our sins don't matter? Well, let's break, that's a good question. Let's break it down. Um, if the questioner is asking like we humanity, every seven, billion people or whatever no longer go to hell? No, that's not what it means. Um, if the questioner is asking me, mm -hmm. I, well, that depends because scripture says he who has the father and she who has the father, uh, the son has the father and has life. But he who does not have the son does not have life. And so the question that I would ask the questioner is, okay, well, let's back up and ask, first of all, do you have Christ? Because if you do, then the answer to your question is yes, your sins, past, present, and future, and that's the mystery of it, have been forgiven. Um, if you don't have Christ, then don't think about seven billion people around the world. Let's get this dealt with first. What about your soul? Because that's the only soul that you can um, uh, control. Have you opened your soul up to the transforming power of Jesus Christ? Have you appropriated him into your life as your savior yet and taken up his indwelling spirit inside of you yet? Because that's um, where we've got to start. And so you talk about meeting Jesus and letting him in, mm -hmm. but what does it mean to let him in? What changes like your outlook on life mm -hmm. or because you can get drunk and your outlook, outlook changes. Sure. What What does it mean? Or you get sleepy. <laughs> and your outlook and, changes. And you get groggy and irritable <laughs> and your outlook changes. What, what does it mean? Yeah. What are we letting in? Yeah, what we're letting in is his presence through the power of his Holy Spirit, who says, I wanna come in to you and fill you up with my power. And so that word in the New Testament that we translate dynamite, that dunamis, that <laughs> raised Christ from the dead. He says that same power can raise you to life. And that's what I want to bring into you through uh, my Holy Spirit coming in and filling you up. And so that's what we're letting in mm -hmm. to um, transform us. Now, to be certain, you can still get drunk and you can still be groggy and tired and irritable, um, but there is something objectively different about the person who really has said, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life, to be Lord of my life, to transform me. That even in our uh, tiredest moments, we can access, I don't know that sometimes we'll choose to, but we can access and say, even in my fatigue, Lord, I need your supernatural strength to give me patience with mm -hmm. my spouse or with my children or with this irritable person at work and, and let your grace flow through me. One of the things I remember one of my heroes of the faith saying is, I just want to be, I want my body to be like a suit of clothing for the Holy Spirit to live inside mm -hmm. of. And I think that's a good word picture, just saying, Lord, I'm asking you now to 
come in and I'll just be the suit of clothing or like the country song says, I'll let you take over the steering wheel or any number of songs have been written, metaphors of the whole concept of letting Christ have control of our lives. But um, it's something that ultimately you can stand outside of, I would say to the questioner and look from the outside in and wonder about, but then finally you have to decide, am I going to step into this? Mm -hmm. Because it's only in stepping in that you can experience like, oh, that's what you were talking about mm -hmm. when a person steps into that. So you made a statement. You said, if you gut the resurrection mm -hmm. out of Christianity, then you don't have much left. Sure. Why? Why must the resurrection completely define Christianity? So it separates it from other religions, uh, but why is resurrecting from death to spend eternity with God the most important thing? Shouldn't our primary importance be on bettering the world or treating other people as Jesus did? Uh, should we act like it's just merely a reward? Uh, or because Jesus gave us this perfect example to love people, and if you love God, you'll love them. Why do the teachings have to hinge on the teacher rising from sure. the dead? Well, um, if you just want a religion with some platitudes, uh, you know, and some... Uh, you know, little pithy sayings like, you know, spring comes after winter and every cloud has a silver lining and, and these sorts of things. Well, that's what you get if you take the resurrection out of Christianity. Um, all you'll get is just another moralistic religion. Um, because in the final analysis, that's what every religion is. It's like you need to, our religion says you got to pray facing this direction five times a day. This is how we do it. Get in line. Okay, I'll get in line. You know, and, and um, or we believe in doing this. And if you don't do that, then you're not one of us. And it's all about what you do. Um, it's all about um, your uh, behavior and your, um, your, you know, these actions that you're doing to stay in. Christianity is originating from a totally different place, a place where we're saying, no, 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 no. We're gonna do some great things and we're gonna serve other people, yes, and we're gonna care for the poor, yes, and we're gonna push the darkness of the world back and help uh, uh, you know, take care of our uh, nature and all this stuff that God's given to us. Yes, but it's originating from an altogether different place than just every other religion lined up side by side. Ours is being re, uh, derived from this place of life, of resurrection, of newness, because of what happened on that first Easter, that our guy beat death. And that's what changes everything and then makes us be people who aren't saying, okay, I guess I better get up and go save the planet again another day and do some more good things. Why? Well, just because that's what you're supposed to do. No, to now I have this transforming relationship with Jesus. I get to go into the world and change the world and help people and, and better the world and these sorts of things. Why? Because I've got the source of life inside I of mean, me. I think about these things that we do are hard in our flesh. Like without Jesus inside of us, it's hard to love people and sure. serve people and do the things we do. And so with that yeah. source of life inside us, mm -hmm. we're able to do these things. Yeah. And uh, we talked about today so much about your eyes being open and your heart being open. And I just pray that many were today and many more will. So thank you for your message. It was great. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.